Good evening and welcome to our closing plenary session. We hope you have had very engaging and productive discussions and now we'd like to take the opportunity to share with you some of the key messages learned from the Global Landscapes Forum. And I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, Dr. Patrick Verkoyhen. Dr. Patrick Verkoyhen is Special Representative for Climate Change at the World Bank. He is also the sustainable he is also a professor in sustainable development diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Boston. Prior to his appointment as a special representative for climate change, uh, Patrick was head of agriculture and climate change at the World Bank. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we want to do it slightly different today. We want to have a very lively debate with this panel. Um, we will make very interesting um, remarks. But first of all, we would like to um, welcome all of you here in this closing plenary. I think we had an extraordinary weekend um, here in this hall. And I specifically want to thank the organizers of this forum, Peter, uh, Bruce, the, the Deputy Rector, the Vice Minister, the Minister of Environment this morning. This is really, really special. What we want to do in this closing plenary is to bring the key messages together, what we discussed over the last uh, two days. And I think we have an extraordinary panel for that. We have the world of power, the world of politics. We have scientists at the table. We have negotiators. We have the world of practice. And we're all going to bring that together. And I think what the common thread of this weekend, at least where I said, was that collectively we're trying to build a movement, a movement on landscapes, a movement on climate smart agriculture. It's also, I think, fair to, to say that there are two worlds. There is a world of action this weekend here, and there is a world of negotiation on the other side of the river. And those worlds are not necessarily integrated. Quite frankly, those worlds are quite separated. And from this side of the, of the river this weekend, there was a clear desire to bridge, to bridge those two worlds, to tear down that, that uh, wall. What we do know is if we want to build a movement, we have to demonstrate success. What does work on the ground? Climate smart agriculture, landscape approaches, what works, what doesn't work, what can we replicate, what can we scale up? What we also know is that we need to communicate in a particular way. We cannot just have one singular message. The message needs to be tailored. The message on landscapes to the finance minister is different than a message on landscapes to the farmer or to the private sector, we need to have a tailored approach also on communication. Bruce himself said in a blog a few days ago, not sure, Bruce, that you still remember, is that the UN system has failed, has failed to include agriculture. Peter said in a blog that landscapes are not a solution, but they are the solution. And one way to build the movement on climate smart agriculture in the landscape approach is indeed to convene here for the weekend. We had an extraordinary weekend, as I said before. 1,000 people showed up yesterday, 1,200 people today. We had over 30 sessions over the weekend. This is extraordinary. Another way to build a movement is indeed to message out, not just here in this room, but also with the world outside, whether it's negotiators or it's people at home, people at the farms. And I think the team of C4 and CCAP did an extraordinary job in bringing in, let's say, using social media um, to get the message out. Um, over the weekend, 600 people used, um, uh, actively tweeted, reached over one and a half million people. That's quite an extraordinary. Even to put it into context, our communication director uh, informed me today that over the weekend there was so much activity on Twitter that the specific Twitter account of this website even was on par with the COP19 website. And that even there was confusion that the Twitter account of this particular conference was the Twitter account of the other conference. So there was quite a um, confusion in, in, in the world, but that was good. That's a way um, that this topic is alive. But I think it's also fair to say there's much more that needs to be done. This is the beginning of a movement, this is a journey, this is a closing plenary, but this is not the end. And what is absolutely vital in, uh, uh, in our view is that we need political leadership. Well, we have political leadership here. We have the Under Secretary of, uh, of Agriculture of the um, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Poland, um, Ms. Christina Gorbil. 
Minister Goebel is Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Agriculture, as I just said, and she is responsible for the European Union International Corporation. And before that, uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, Minister Gobil was also the Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of Economic uh, Affairs and Labour. So she brings the two worlds together within the cabinet, and we're delighted to have uh, you with us, uh, Minister. And we would love to hear from your experience what is happening in Poland on landscapes uh, and climate and agriculture. What can we learn from Poland? How does it relate to the negotiations? And how can we collectively move forward? Delighted to have you here. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank very much the, uh, our organizers of this forum to uh, come forward with this initiative. I think it was a very good initiative in the context of the, uh, of the climate summit, but also uh, for us, for, for people living in Poland and uh, especially in Warsaw, to have the occasion to take part in those lively discussions over those two days on the subject which is very important throughout the world, and also in my own country, but which sometimes is not yet seen as important. So I think it was a very good occasion, uh, a very good event, uh, which uh, has brought not only uh, merit discussions, but also increase of the public awareness of the issues which, uh, which have been uh, discussed uh, during this forum. So once more, uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank very warmly uh, our co-organizers and, uh, and I would like to stress that uh, both uh, the minister and, and our, all our ministry were very happy to, uh, about the fact that the global forum this year could sit in Poland. Uh, and that is uh, even more so because Poland is particularly attached to our rural and agricultural traditions. We've been always convinced that landscape, nature, and the env environment of Poland favorably distinguish us, while ag agriculture is an important component of the economy and landscape of our country. Agricultural lands occupy nearly half of the country and the arable land over one third of the whole area of Poland. Rural landscape in Poland is very diverse as a result of natural, economic, and historical <coughs> conditions. I do hope that we had, uh, you had some occasion to let, look at the posters which have been uh, put uh, both in front of the university and in this uh, big tent uh, of the forum and see some, uh, some examples of those rural landscapes which we are very proud of. Typical for our agricultural landscape is so-called patchwork of land, a mosaic, a type of mosaic of various soils and crops which is due to the fact that half of about 1.5 million Polish agricultural holdings are small family holdings, uh, really very small, with a large number of small plots of land. So on one hand, it creates economic difficulties uh, for the farmers. On the other hand, it helps in keeping, in uh, maintaining um, uh, biodiversity and those traditional characteristics of the landscape which, uh, which uh, are kept for centuries in our, in our country. Traditional landscape elements include also bulks, small tree groupings, old orchards, small wetlands, lakes, and ponds. So it's really something which is unique for our country and which we would like to keep even though the uh, transition of agriculture is necessary and farmers have to cope with new uh, challenges and requirements of the uh, present economic situation and also of the climate changes. On a global scale, uh, uh, agriculture becomes a, stra a strategic sector because it shoulders the bulk of the enormous challenge of feeding the growing population of the world. And uh, it has to do it in the context of climate changes that are taking place. And that was discussed during different events of the, of the forum quite extensively. We have to look actively for solutions to increase food production in spite of climate changes and as far as possible without any additional burden of the environment. And that's the challenge which lies in front of all of us. 
The good news is that farmers around the world have knowledge pooled over generations on how to take care of the landscape, the environment, and on how, in harmony with natural processes, to uh, supply food for their societies. The need to adapt continuously to, ne to new conditions belongs to the essence of farming. Farmers are also the first to experience climate changes and adapt to them, as well as the first to make decisions and try to remedy the losses at the farm level. However, although farmers are experts, um, one can say, in coping with such changing situations, we do need more and better economic and institutional solutions to use the natural potential of the agricultural communities in the best way. And this was the subject discussed and raised during many presentations uh, during the forum of uh, yesterday and today. We need innovative, adaptive solutions, as well as technologies, increasing production, and at the, at the same time, environmental, environment and climate protection friendly. This aspect of innovation is very important and I think it was discussed, but it really needs looking into more carefully so as to find solutions which would fit different environmental and economic situations, different landscapes, different farming communities, so that really the changes which are in front of us could be coped with efficiently. Uh, so the forums such as the present Global Landscape Forum are really, in our opinion, a very important element of the discussion bringing forward new solutions uh, and new decisions. The fact that the forum involved more than, uh, well, more over 1,000 people, as was also already mentioned, from over 90 countries around the world is a proof on, at the same time that we uh, do recognize the importance of agriculture and forestry sectors in the today's era of global challenges and with, that we see urgent need for discussions and finding solutions acceptable to different actors, to different stakeholders. Such forums, and that's I think a very important uh, uh, quality of, of such gatherings, allow to interests, interest and gather stakeholders from very different uh, angles. Scientists, politicians, non-governmental organizations, business or environment, and also media, which uh, creates the situations which allow to increase awareness and uh, find ways for new solutions and new paths. Agriculture is a sector with high expectations to climate negotiations. Farmers around the world expect progress in the climate negotiations and specific solutions. I'm convinced that the conclusions reached by the Global Landscapes Forum will bring us closer to an agreement also on climate negotiations, an agreement which should take into account the requirements of agriculture and of landscapes around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam uh, Minister, for your, for your inspiring words. Four key messages I took uh, out of your um, address. One, we need innovation. Innovation in finance, innovation in policy, and inv innovation in technology. Two, farmers are at the heart of the solution and um, are very able to adapt, but they need to be supported. Three, Agriculture is inherently linked, it's a strategic sector inherently linked to climate change. And lastly, uh, public awareness is really, really, really critical. On, now we move to uh, the world of action in Africa, and we are extraordinarily pleased to have here with us Prince Sisu, Bering Sisu. Uh, Prince Sisu, His Royal Highness, is uh, the Lesotho's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. He's also very active on the ground. He, established in 2006 with Prince Harry of Wales and he formed a charity called Centabal to support um, organizations working in Lesotho's on HIV and AIDS. Interestingly enough, His Royal Highness is also a farmer and we are delighted to hear from His Royal Highness his experience on the ground, what is happening in Africa. Just one footnote, two years ago Africa 
hosted Durban, COP17. At that time, it was very prominent in the negotiations. Africa was clearly leading the way forward. And we would be uh, quite interested to hear from His Royal Highness what his perspective is, what is happening in Africa, and how it relates to the negotiations going forward. I welcome you to the floor, sir. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Patrick, I just, a minor correction. Uh, my stint in London uh, ended about a year and a half ago. Uh, six years in London was long enough. I have been back home in the parliament, in the upper house of parliament in Lesotho, but still in the forefront of the fight that we are fighting on today. Uh, the government of Poland here represented by the honorable minister ministers here present, organizers of the Global Landscape Forum, UNFCCC negotiators and secretariat, distinguished participants. Dobri Vecure. Good evening, for those who don't know. There is an immediate urgency to save our planet and, give, and people given, and planet given the unfolding climate changes scenarios and the very serious potential impact we are already witnessing. For the least developed countries such as Lesotho, climate change is already having an adverse effect on food security which has a major impact on livelihoods. Given that there is a large rural population entirely dependent on agriculture, farming and, from, and, for, and forest products, the projected changes in future temperatures and rainfall patterns for 2030 in southern Africa indicates a significant decline in production of major staple crops such as maize, wheat, and sorghum. In accepting the, the invitation to speak at this forum, it became very clear to me and apparent that I will have to be the torchbearer or part of the torchbearers and for the Africa Voices and share with you some first-hand experiences. Large areas of Southern Africa experienced over eight periods of drought during the 19th century with six wetter phases which brought widespread flooding. Coming closer to the present time, during 1992, 20 million people in the region were in need of food relief due to the drought. While food deficiency was due pr pr principally to the drought, socio-economic and principally political factors also contributed to the problems. My country, the Kingdom of Lesotho, with degraded land, degra degraded lands and higher sensitivities to climate hazards has suffered the, mo has suffered the most as compared to those with which enjoy good vegetation cover and soil water filter, filtration abilities. Erosion of, so, of soil surfaces through constant grazing, severe overstocking, collection of fuel woods, and constant plowing on, on croplands multiply the effect of climate events such as drought and heavy rainfall on soil losses. Heavy rains do not filtrate easily into such degraded soils and runoff, taking with it vast amounts of nutrients and organic matters rich topsoil. In the long term, declining water, groundwater levels in the entire region will reduce the availability of safe water for people, home, home gardens, and livestock. The impact of climate change on livelihoods, food security, nutrition at household level, and the environment and the environment has been absolutely devastating. By failing to safeguard our natural resources, farmers are experiencing diminishing returns from their investments. Sadly, they have they've had to sell off meager physical uh, assets of their own, failing to feed their own families. And worse still, the aging farming generation has failed to attract the young as farming has become the business of the poor 
who depend more and more on handouts. This has to be reversed and several fundamental imperatives are set here forward. Short-term fixes that increase yields without safeguarding the environment are not sustainable and future generations will pay most heavily. The policy environment at national and global levels has to be holistic, creating connectivity between people, agriculture, forestry, environment, and trade. To a small holder, there's no divide between agriculture and forestry. Farming is about good stewardship, good, good stewards of the biodiversity. African farmers want to adapt to climate change, but lack the knowledge and financial resources to, ac to access climate smart agricultural technologies. Evidence and science has, has had Evidence, has point, ha, ha, evidence at hand points at, landscape approach, at, at a landscape approach being the renewed opportunity for the holistic, long-term, and all-inclusive solutions to mitigating and adapting to climate change. The compelling imperative the world faces is to address hunger, malnutrition, climate justice, provide the opportunity for us to all to benefit. May I then say to you all as we wind up this evening, there may be 10 points that you may take home from Lesotho or from my thoughts. The negative impact of climate change on food and nutrition, security of vulnerable households is an injustice. Bringing grassroots pot practitioners, the youth, the policymakers together to have a, respect of, a respectful dialogue works and should be done more often through the post 2015 development agenda discuss, discussions and beyond by civil society, the private sector, governments and multilateral, multilateral organizations. And for our African brothers and sisters here present, a fractured continent, a continental voice, approach and lobby has led us to a very disastrous consequences and at the negotiation tables. Difficult political and cultural issues must not be avoided. The private sector has an important role to play in addressing the linked ch challenges of hunger, undernutrition, and climate change. We need to raise awareness at all levels of the process that, that are in train for post 2015 development so that, so that people can be engaged with it. There is need to con connect the 2015 international process, the MDGs, the SDGs, and the delivery of climate change deals that include agriculture. Strength strengthening institutions and establishing platforms for real dialogue. Women are at the heart of the effective solutions. Developed countries need to reduce their greenhouse emissions and deliver on commitments to provide financial fin financing for adaptation. Let us place at the center of everything we do, not be afraid to empower people or protect their rights. Forestry and agriculture must be brought together to tackle climate change, food security, and food security. Only when we take a landscape approach and look beyond farming at all the variables that affect our land, can we, boast, can we boost agriculture production while adapting agriculture to climate change and reducing agricultural emissions? Thank you for giving us this opportunity to receive the latest evidence on climate change's impacts on agriculture, forests, and environment, and livelihoods. I hope that you will all commit yourselves to this message. And from today, the science, the evidence is out there. It is time for us to go out to the fields and implement what we've been saying this whole two days. I thank you. Thank you so much, Your Royal, Your Royal Highness, for sharing your vision and um, action agenda and reminding us that 
agriculture, poverty, and food security are interlinked and cannot be addressed separately. Also, by reminding us that connecting people, agriculture, forests, and trade is vital. We now go from Africa to East Asia, and I have the honor to introduce Hiro Prasetio. Hiro Prasetio is the Deputy Head of Planning and International Relations in Indonesia's President's Delivery Unit for Development, Monitoring, and Oversight. Prior to this, he was the Director for International Relations and very um, active in the rehabilitation at, in uh, Aceh in 2005 until 2009. Hiro has extensive private sector experience, and we are delighted to hear from what we can learn from Indonesia on the ground as it moves forward in its um, uh, agenda on RAP and forest in particular. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, Excellency Ministers, Your Royal Highness. My pleasure and very honored to be in this impressive room together with you. Indonesia has a space land of like 190 million hectares and 120 million hectares of which are supposed to be forest. I will say supposed to be forest because we have not been very convinced the size of the forest exactly because of the lack of the one single map that we are now correcting. Indonesia's president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, my president, has stated that the development strategy of Indonesia consists of what we call the 741. We want to have 7% growth, but also a reduction of emission by 41% with the support of a global partnership. Not only that 741 is our vision, it's not only our strategy, but it has to be achieved with equity. And that is a tall order for anyone. So when in the year 2010, we start embarking in earnest, our move for Red Plus, we found landscape. And the reason why I said that we found landscape during our journey on Red Plus is that we went down to the people, we go to the ground and try to understand what is the real problem and that Red Plus can solve and why is Red Plus important for us. We realized at that time that dealing or talking about carbon alone, it's like crying in the deaf ears of our indigenous people. People don't know what carbon, people don't understand what carbon, and people are very much disillusioned when people say that Red Plus is about payment. So there is a figure, a thinking that payment money will come from the sky for them if we embark on Red Plus without really understanding what carbon is. So excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we go down and try to understand the problem from the ground and lo and behold, what we have seen there is what we now know as the landscape approach. It is an issue that is very, very conflicting between food, between livelihood, between energy, between access, between services, and be between that with the well-being of humans. So in a way, when we found out landscape approach from the ground, not from the schools, not from the offices, and not from the position like this, we immediately connect that well as well with green economy. Because if we get back to the core of the green economy that says that it is for the benefit, improvement of the human well-being, engaging and increasing social equity, 
with uh, minimizing the environmental risk as well as the ecological scarcity. Then suddenly we realized that the concept of red that we understand, that we implement in Indonesia, landscape and green economy are actually the same concept, say in different ways, in different scale. So having said that, and we look into the landscape that we face in the forest, nearby the forest, as well as the pressure into that, we ask ourselves the question of what is this landscape, what it can be, and what needs to be done to make it a sustainable growth with equity for everyone, which is actually getting into that green economy itself. We translate that, ladies and gentlemen, into our national strategy that we address those issues a la landscape, but the way that we interpret that with our own way of seeing in language. But then we see, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, that the landscape approach is not enough. When we get into the engagement of the post-2015 development agenda through the high-level panel, where my president is a co-chair, and I was asked to be the secretary of the national committee for that, we realize that the challenge that we face as the community of the world is larger than that. Let me give you, if I can show that on the screen, some example of what we are facing in a national level that perhaps is also the same that what you are having. And this issue is very simple issue that every country will face. And that is the rice supply. For us, rice is our key commodity for food. Look into the situation at the farmer's level, and we try to see that on a landscape approach. The land that the farmer have can actually be used for forest, it can be used for housing, it can be used for palm oil, it can be used for rice. And when we look into that, we see and we understand that we are touching more than one ministry. You're talking about Ministry of Agriculture, you're talking about the Ministry of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. On the level of the farmers itself already, we are talking about the Ministry of Public Works and the Ministry of Water Works at the same time. Very difficult in our experience, let's be very honest, to organize and to coordinate those three ministries in the landscape way of thinking. And then from the farmers, it goes to the middlemen. When the middlemen are private sectors, and they have their own paradigms in terms of how to do business and how to do livelihood. So the, the middleman becomes an element in your landscape that is suddenly not related to any ministry. But then it goes to the rice millers. The rice millers is under the Ministry of Industry and Small Ex Enterprises. And then it goes again to the issue that we have not enough stock, and because of that, we import from Vietnam, from India, and from other places. So there is a flow of rice that is coming from outside, outside our landscape, outside our scope. And then it has to go down into the, stock, the rice stock of the government, and that is under the Ministry of State-Owned Enterprises. Ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine just for this one commodity how complex it is? The reality on the ground, when you're talking about the landscape approach, that it gets into something that is more complex than that. When we get into the global level from the post-2015 development agenda discussion, we know that there are four flows that we need to observe globally. The first is the flow of goods. And those flows, ladies and gentlemen, are actually going across your landscape uh, definition. How do we deal with the flow of goods when you are talking about the trading of goods across country, across landscape? And that is actually right now being discussed in WTO. And then you have the flow of funds, the flow of money. That is also again going over across your landscape. Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, we also know that there is a flow of people, 
Migration is a key issue. One, mil one billion people migrate every year. 250 million migrate across country and 700, 750 million inside country boundaries. Those migration is also going across your landscape. So what you see today as the people there may not be the one that is going to be seen tomorrow because of the flow. And last but not least, there is a flow of idea, there is a flow of technology, there is a flow of knowledge that needs to be done. How do we transfer technology to make sure that our landscape is actually being treated with the best technology and knowledge from all over the world? There has been some question, how about the local wisdom? Can it be used to another country as well? Of course, but then there is this rule about the local and the transfer of technology that applies everywhere. So ladies and gentlemen, my point here is that when I got, when, I, when we found the, the landscape approach and how it is so useful and so powerful to explain what we need and what we need to know, my point and the question is, how does the landscape approach should look like in the year 2015, that should look like in the year 2020? Please, I beg that we need to consider not only the landscape itself and its dynamics, but also the flow that cross over them. This is something that we learn, that I learn from this conference, is something that I learn from everybody of you, so that what I found during my Red Plus journey is something that I get the confirmation from this meeting. Indonesia, ladies and gentlemen, is learning very much from this meeting, from this gathering of two days, and because of that, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of Indonesia for what we have learned today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Hero, for your inspirational words. Uh, I also would like to say that the world has learned a lot from the Indonesian experience. Um, today, by unpacking the complexity of the problem and by linking what we can learn from the ground and how to link it to um, the green growth model, that's extraordinarily important. What has been said throughout the day is that women should be at the heart of the, so of the solution. Also, that youth has a very important role to play. So therefore, we are delighted to have today with us, Tembi Nindama. Tembi is a youth ambassador on landscapes. Um, this is a, a title which doesn't exist formally, but on the ground, behind the scenes, Tembi is extraordinarily important. Why? Over the last few months, Tembi ran a grassroots campaign. Um, C4 and uh, Bruce Shop opened up a contest for youth organizations to come forward with the best actions programs um, and ideas which could happen and work on the ground. Um, Tembi uh, led and convened um, a youth session here um, um, during the forum and we would like to hear from you what your key findings were and what would you like to share with this group uh, in going forward. Thank you so much and welcome to the podium. Honorable Deputy Minister of Environment of Fallen, His Royal Highness, Pris Seiso Bereng Seiso, government officials present here, organizers of the Global Landscapes Forum, my fellow youth over there, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you all. Most often, important global debates and decision-making processes and natural resources and development take place without the involvement of young people. I'm happy to say that the Global Landscapes Forum has been different. Thank you for affording us the opportunity to feedback on what was an exciting and insightful session. In September 2013, the Young Professionals Platform for Agriculture Research and Development, YPAD, and C4, pitched the idea for a youth session at the GLF. And funny enough, it was accepted. A call for submissions of inspirational stories from youth champions and thought leaders 
was sent out to various youth networks and organizations. And a total of 150 submissions from over 50 countries were received. The stories were posted on the Global Landscapes Forum website, and youth from across the world began voting on the best stories they wanted to share. From the 150 submissions, 10 youth champions and thought leaders were selected to come and share their stories here at the GLF. Yesterday, the youth session was attended by close to 200 young people, and those were young at heart. <laughs> the event was webcast to hundreds online, some of whom were able to share and contribute to the discussion during the question and answer segment of the program. What we discovered during the session is that youth-driven initiatives are proving that agriculture can be attractive to young people when innovative solutions are applied to meet certain key challenges. Ten young speakers took the floor to talk about their experiences in sustainable entrepreneurship, overcoming negative perceptions of employment in landscape sectors, capacity building, and the power of collectives for young people. We had inspiring stories from the Philippines to Uganda. In the Philippines, we had that young people are getting themselves organized around land rights issues. In Uganda, young men are working to improve landscapes degraded and devastated by years of the Civil War. The presentations were followed by a lively, dis a lively discussion of innovative ideas on how to better manage our landscapes. The discussions ended with a challenge from Bruce, where he challenged the youth to initiate a positive revolution that will change the climate and development agenda for forest and agriculture beyond 2015. Yesterday, young people proved that they are fully engaged in a wide range of activities, from research to social media. Key recommendations from the session include the following. In developing sustainable solutions to tackle climate change issues, the UNFCCC must engage and listen to the voice of the youth in the landscape sector, who can contribute much needed innovative ideas and energy. But in addition to that, capacity development of youth movements within these processes is critical for them to be able to contribute to the future they want to see. The youth are ready and willing to engage. The landscape approach requires a new breed of young professionals who are able to work across different sectors to achieve sustainable development goals. And the youth can be that breed of professionals. The landscape approach also requires young people that can take advantage of opportunities at different stages of the value chain, resulting in improved food security, better remuneration for young people, all this happening in harmony with the environment. The world cannot afford to continue making decisions for young people without consulting them. We would like to thank CTA, GIFA, and the CGIR for believing in the youth and supporting youth engagement in the landscape sector. We believe that we must carry on the efforts for better youth inclusion, and this will only be possible through support of stakeholders like yourself gathered here at the GLF. Through your work, think about how you can better engage and build capacity of the youth to achieve sustainable landscapes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tembi, for sharing your energy and uh, innovation, and particularly your call for action, and you're ready to help building this uh, movement. Um, I now would like to move from the world of action to the world of negotiations. We've talked about it a lot over the last uh, two days, and we have with us here, and we're delighted that you're here, Salam Kidan. Um, it's only two years ago that I met Salam during a um, workshop in Paris where over 30 negotiators, agriculture negotiators, came together. It was just before Durban, and that group tried to 
figure out in an informal setting amongst themselves what should be the outcome of the COP17 in Durban. And there was one person who really stood out, who really advocated very strongly and very persuasively that agriculture should be part of the solution. Salam was that person, and we are now delighted to hear from you your vision of where the agriculture negotiations stand and uh, how we can move forward. Salam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for, for the good presentation, uh, for introducing me. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Salam. Um, uh, good evening all, uh, excellencies, Excellency Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, and the UNFCCC dear colleague negotiators. Uh, I was requested by the Global Landscape Forum uh, to discuss how the negotiations on agriculture were going. So just as Patrick mentioned, <clears throat> the agricultural discussions were got momentum when the discussions was moved from AWGA, LCA, the Ad Hoc Working Group on Long-Term Cooperative Actions to Sebasta. The decision was made in CP17 in Durban. That was a great momentum for, dis for discussing agriculture on scientific and technical basis. So the discussion, Substa is one of the subsidiary body for the UNFCCC mandated to discuss scientific and technical issues. So the discussion on agriculture started to be more scientific and technical issues were supposed to be discussed. So the negotiations focused on the items that we need science to be involved in, in the technology or the scientific advices that we need from the, secret, from the UNFCCC. Progress was made in Doha. We had a good text, but text, our agriculture is very important for, for very many parties. So our interests or our needs might be a bit different. So parties one were compromising of their interests, taking taking good notes of other parties' interests. So even if we couldn't get any decision in, in Doha, we had a good draft text to be taken to the next Sebsta, Sebsta 39, 2013. At Sebsta 39, 2013, discussions were more substantiated. Uh, the draft text was very helpful. So it was a great success that we came to discuss real scientific discussions because of the conclusions we had in Bonn last, la, in the last Substa 39. Uh, the conclusion focused on discussing uh, having a workshop on agriculture, on the core benefits, core benefits meaning adaptation and mitigation benefits, scale, potential, and different items of agriculture to be discussed within a workshop where scientists were there, not political experts or policy experts like me. So the first workshop on the name of agriculture under UNFCCC, the first workshop was made in Warsaw. That was last Tuesday. We had a great workshop. The workshop was like, kicked off from a presentation from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And then FAO made, a FAO made an interesting presentation, pure science, which I couldn't understand, but it was, well, it went well. <laughs> Just to give you a brief update, in addition to that, parties made their submissions of what they want from agriculture, and also uh, there was an interesting panel of negotiators that presented their parties' interest from the negotiations, and it was a great workshop. To mention some of the items discussed, climate change impacts on agriculture was discussed, so sub regional, sub-regional, uh, national adaptation, the importance of adaptation plans were discussed. Also, IPCC, especially working the, the, the working group one, the brief summary report indicated that there would be more extreme events. So parties focused on how to reduce these impacts. In addition to that, the adaptation plans or the adaptations we need from the discussion will be more contextual, nationally appropriate for these countries. Um, there were more commonalities because agriculture for most of the parties, whether you are producing it, selling it out, or getting, buying it and importing it to the country, agriculture was important for all countries in that, 
and the UNFCCC in most of the UNFCCC party countries. So that was more a commonality, need for more knowledge, scientific knowledge, technical knowledge, and also how to manage that, how the management of knowledge or transferring it, capacity building, were effectively, like they were discussed thoroughly. Uh, furthermore, uh, there were commonalities of continuing the discussion on agriculture. So uh, th our, our workshop was more scientific than uh, we had some discussions on that and also we went back to the negotiation um, hats. So on the negotiations, um, we could not establish contact groups in the scope. Um, the contact groups are one of the important groups where you take something you have done to the next item formally and you have mandate to do that, but we could not establish that, but we had bilaterals and we, had a, we have a conclusion. Our conclusion on agriculture this year at COP19 will be to continue the discussion of agriculture at SEPSTA 14 and also to endorse the report of the workshop, what we had, the scientific issues and the coming SEPSTA 14, which will be on May 2014. The way forward as a negotiator will be uh, to work, like all, I, I think all the fellow negotiators will agree with me, agriculture is an important issue, we know that, and it has contributed to our livelihoods every day. So uh, the discussion on, on Substar are, are important and I believe they are going to continue and will continue. Uh, in that area, more information on the sector, scientific information, whether it's adaptation, mitigation, or if we can get both, of fr both from one act, that will be something science could answer to us. Uh, capacity building would be some of the things we can discuss how to do it. That is a body that can help us do that. And also, how can we manage this? How, how can we do the technology transfer? What is country's needs, what are the specific needs of parties, are, is the venue that we can discuss Substa, at Substa. So this will be the discussion points for the coming years and hope we will get a good decision next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Salam, for your detailed and uh, comprehensive account. I mean, it became clear to me that after uh, the previous speaker how, uh, who addressed the, the complexity on the ground, it also reminded me the, the complexity of the negotiations. And I think what is required is that our community here finds a way to communicate lessons learned on the ground in practice into the words of the negotiators. I think that kind of discourse interchange is very important. Um, also, what is clear that the negotiator, there is, a, as you indicated yourself, there is a need of transferring our knowledge base, which is happening on the ground. We're collecting it as a group, as a community, and that should be um, uh, going forward at full steam. Um, going forward, we are delighted to have Tony, Tony Lavina here with us. Tony was the whole day in um, negotiations uh, as the lead negotiator of, uh, of the Philippines. He's in this uh, business for uh, two decades, as I uh, believe. Um, He's also the Dean of the School of Government, and that makes an interesting a combination of uh, a diplomat, a negotiator, and an academic scholar who can bring these worlds uh, together. Tony, um, if, I'm, uh, if you allow me, I just want to quote uh, a live chat in the Guardian newspaper last week which uh, quoted you, and uh, you indicated there that um, the following. On helping the poor, mitigate and adapt to climate change. That's obviously a priority, you said. But a better way of framing this is actually working with the poor. Poor farmers, indigenous peoples, women, youth, should be part of the solution. We're delighted that you're here with us today, and uh, we look forward to your views and vision um, around this particular topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, and I apologize for uh, coming late for the plenary. In these days, this is the days when I wish I had a scale of by location, you know, being in two or even three different places at the same time, uh, you know, being involved in the negotiations, uh, uh, doing a lot of side events and, and projects as well since, since, uh, since I, I run a school that has a lot of work on, on climate change. And then uh, 
I have to say that most of my mind and my spirit is, is more in the Philippines than, than here in Warsaw, although there's lots of work here, of course, that's relevant to, to, to Warsaw. Let me share three things. One is the, the main uh, thing I was asked to do for, for this uh, session, which is to update you on, on the forest and the Red Plus negotiations. I actually had suggested to, to invite instead, instead of me, uh, the different chairs of the, the, the different forest negotiations. There are actually three. Uh, set of red plus negotiations going on, uh, but I guess it's difficult to have all, I think six chairs do the update here. So, so I guess I can be a, a substitute for for that since uh, I'm following it through various colleagues that that I mentor or supervise in in those negotiations. So, so let me do that first. Uh, then I'll talk actually about the landscape approach and what could it mean for the future, and I mean particularly for the 2020. 20 agreement that's going to be at a post-2020 climate regime that will be negotiated, that's being negotiated now and hopefully will be arrived at in, in Paris, because I think that's where that's relevant. And of course, if you uh, allow me to, and, and you have no choice, <laughs> I, will, I have to talk about the Philippines as well, but only for a couple of minutes and I, I won't cry, I'll promise that. Um, on uh, Red Plus, uh, I think it's important to understand the context of where we are in Red Plus. Uh, negotiations now, and I mean, uh, in Copenhagen, we actually arrived at an agreement on Red Plus, but that wasn't adopted. It took, an, because of nothing was adopted in Copenhagen, but in 2010, in Cancun, we adopted a Red Plus agreement. But it was an agreement uh, 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 that necessitated further work. So, in COP16 in Cancun, uh, the COP actually requested Substa to initiate a work program on several methodological issues, uh, developing modalities for RMRV, national forest monitoring systems, forest reference emission levels, guidance for safeguard information systems, addressing drivers of deforestation and forest degradation. And also in that same COP in Cancun, uh, uh, the, the COP requested the uh, LCA, which was still a continuing body then, to explore financing options for the full implementation of results-based actions relating to Red Plus. So quite a, a full plate, if you look at it, around seven or eight uh, tasks were given to these two bodies. I mean, and, and so to see progress, you have to look at that original mandate, for, for those of you who were still there or those of you who were not there, remember that mandate, and actually start checking, because we're now able to check out most of those to check now, to, to if this was a checklist, to actually say most of this mandate uh, in Cancun has actually been achieved. And the concept is that if you finish all of this work, we then are able to go full blast in implementation. Uh, so that's what happened in, in Durban. We started to work on this, this mandate from Cancun. And in Durban, we adopted the decision and guidance and systems for providing information on how safeguards are addressed and respected. It's the famous safeguards information system or SIS, and on modalities relating to forest emission levels and forest reference levels. Uh, we were able to adopt that uh, in, in Durban. We were also, and I actually had the pleasure of chairing that particular negotiation, we also adopted a decision on Red Plus results-based finance, that it may come from a wide variety of sources and that access to it is subject to the full MRV of actions and establishments of elements for Red Plus under the various decisions in the conference of the parties. So I would say in Durban we were able to make good progress, but we still have this long list of other things to, to, uh, to, to negotiate and to agree on. Um, so in Doha, uh, as you know, the LCA closed in Doha. Uh, a number of things were resolved, but several streams were still uh, uh, left. And I mean, and, and Doha was in a way not a good cup for, for, for Red Plus. We were not able to make a lot of progress there. Uh, not so much because of the Red negotiations, but because of other parts in the, in the negotiations. And it's always been the challenge for Red Plus how not to go too far ahead, uh, because if you go too far ahead, you actually get stalemated because you have to wait for other parts of the processes. Um, so instead in Doha, instead of having an agreement on, on anything actually, we ended up essentially creating a work program again on results-based finance to finish what was not finished from the Durban agreement. We also ended up uh, uh, with a process agreement on coordination of support, uh, including uh, institutional arrangements or potential governance alternatives for Red Plus. So in this, a, substa, a joint uh, 
uh, program of Substa and SBI uh, was actually um, uh, decided for this. No? And then issues for consideration by the Substa uh, related to non-market-based approaches and non-carbon benefits were also given. This was a result of the discussions on that year leading to Doha. Uh, uh, in the Philippines, for example, strongly pushed the idea of non-carbon benefits, uh, which I think is also consistent with the landscape approach. And that got accepted as an important agenda for Red Plus uh, Finance. This year, I think, has been, uh, this week, sorry, not this week, this week uh, uh, in this year's COP has been a fruitful uh, week for, for Red Plus, but uh, as we say here, it's not over until it's over because nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. But for Substa, I think those of who participated in these negotiations would, would say they're quite happy with the result. And I mean, uh, essentially, the checklist I mentioned at the beginning is essentially completed in this uh, uh, session. Modalities for national forest monitoring systems uh, has been approved. Na timing and frequency of presentation summary information on safeguards approved. Addressing drivers of uh, deforestation and forest degradation was approved. All of this was approved actually even before we came here. It was approved in June in, 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 in Bonn. Then here in this last week, uh, the negotiators also at the negotiator level at least adopted the draft text and guidance for the technical assessment of reference levels. Um, also, uh, 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 had an agreement on, um, on uh, how the methodological re issues related to non-market-based approaches and non-carbon benefits would be considered. Uh, you know, this is just a, big, a work that's beginning methodologically, so you cannot possibly have an agreement yet. So there's a process of submitting views and, and consideration for the next uh, uh, year. Um, and, and then uh, various uh, things were also looked at uh, in terms of the Substa. Um, uh, so far this week, parties have completed the drafting work on methodological guidance on MRV. Very big achievement because last year, as you know, uh, we got stuck on verification even after a long uh, uh, a couple of days of long nights uh, negotiating, we got stuck, but now that has been uh, essentially um, uh, completed. And the technical assessment of reference levels was also uh, uh, completed. However, let me stress that uh, while this has been all completed and agreed, uh, uh, it's submitted to the substance, to, will be submitted to the COP as bracketed text because the agreement among at the negotiator level is that uh, there, there needs to be a package of agreement on, on the three uh, uh, areas of negotiations going on for Red Plus. The substance negotiations, which as I said, is essentially completed. Uh, uh, the SBI, Substa, um, joint program and coordination, which unfortunately has not made a lot of, of, of progress because of very serious uh, issues about, about particularly the governance bodies that might be created for for Red Plus, and the results-based finance discussion is still going on. In fact, it started only last Friday and, and, and will continue on the whole week. I can imagine that even if SBI has closed, although I've heard that SBI has not yet closed, so maybe they'll have additional discussions and this coordination of support, but uh, I imagine that the, the, in the next week, this discussion on Red Plus-based finance will, uh, will uh, continue. Um, and, 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 and some conclusion will be, be achieved. Um, and I imagine uh, maybe some compromise on coordination of support will also be achieved, allowing us to have a full package on Red Plus at the end of the, end of the week. You know I mean, uh, then allowing countries to implement, you know, with, with uh, faster and with more acceleration, in a more accelerated way, Red Plus uh, in the next five to six years. Uh, uh, since that's really where we are. And I mean, I know countries already moving ahead anyway, even without the full agreement at the, at the COP level of all the different issues. I mean, there's enough, I've always said, even in Cancun, we have enough there to actually move forward uh, on, on implementation on Red Plus on, on the ground. So that's where we are with the negotiations for, for Red Plus. Let me, let me move on to my, my second point, which is about the landscape approach and uh, how it could inform the negotiations for the post-2020 uh, agreement. And, and here is actually more of a challenge to all of you 
uh, of articulating better what a landscape approach means in terms of policy, what are the incentives necessary from a multilateral process and a multilateral agreement to actually get the landscape approach to be approved on the ground, to be, uh, to be actually implemented, to accelerate it, to be supported on, on uh, uh, the ground. My own understanding of the landscape approach, and that's why it's, it's very uh, attractive to me, is that it's an uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, integrated adaptation mitigation approach to, to climate change. I mean, and, and, and I have convinced, I have really been convinced, uh, I, I, I have come to, be, to really believe after 20 years of doing this both, you know, I, I worked, I've been in the negotiation since, since even before the framework convention was adopted, uh, and I have been uh, also implementing things on the ground, uh, both from the government side as well as from the energies for the last 20 years, uh, and I'm really convinced that the only thing that works, at least in developing countries, is an integrated approach for adaptation and uh, of adaptation and mitigation. Uh, when you disaggregate the two, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail. Um, and so that's why for me a landscape approach is attractive if it actually allows us to do that in the field of, of, uh, of, of land use. No? Um, and, and so the challenge is in the next year uh, uh, to actually influence the negotiations uh, with an approach like this. Uh, for land use, I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a choice that, that the parties will have for land use for this 2020 agreement. One is to just grandfather all the agreements. LULUCF, um, RED Plus, Agriculture, although as Simon pointed out, there's not much in agriculture yet in terms of tax. Uh, uh, one is to just grandfather and say, well, we'll adapt this. This is the 2020 agreement. RED Plus will continue beyond 2020, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that would be a lost opportunity if we, if we do that. I mean, uh, um, I certainly want to revisit LULUCF. I mean, to, uh, I chaired the LULUCF negotiations in Kyoto and actually drafted the, the provisions of uh, the specific paragraphs of LULUCF, and I, I would like the chance to revisit that, uh, quite honestly, to, to make it uh, 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 more imbued with environmental integrity than I think uh, it is. Uh, it was the best decision at the time. I would defend it in any way at the time, but I think it's time to actually look at that as well. And then to see it in an integrated way with, with, with Red Plus and, and the work that we do in forests in developing countries, and see as well with, with agriculture. Um, and, and, I, and I think uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to do that because right now there's very little discussion in the ADP on land use. There was a, a workshop in April, uh, in, the, in, the first me in the meeting of ADP in April, uh, to our discussion of all very general. Um, so I think there's, a, there's, there's an opportunity to try to influence that, but we have to double up, double our work to get, or triple our work to get that to, to, to happen and really get some ideas uh, out there on what incentives we need for this landscape approach to be implemented, to be, to be the one adopted for, for the Paris uh, Agreement. And let me go now to the last uh, point I want to make. I mean, it's, uh, it's about the Philippines, but it's also about the landscape approach of an integrated adaptation and mitigation um, approach. And, and, and I'll start with sharing a personal thing about, about my work on climate change. In the first 10 years of climate change, like many of you who were in this work, my focus of the work was actually on mitigation. Um, I've attended 15 of the 19 COPs. And if you ask me, what were the four cups that you didn't attend? Those were the four cups at the height of the Bush, George W. Bush years, because I felt like it was useless to attend the COP uh, during the time. But it was a very good opportunity for me and a good moment for me, because it made me realize that adaptation was just as important, maybe more important than, uh, than mitigation. That morally, it was wrong to actually, for, in a country like the Philippines, to put too much money in mitigation without putting money at all in adaptation. If all the scientists were telling us that climate change impacts was a reality, then, then we had the moral obligation to actually in, uh, invest those resources. So that, that helped, no? because then, then in going back to the negotiations and, and writing a lot about it and influencing it, 
you know, was one of those that, that started this whole idea of adaptation has to be as important as the agenda. And, and very successful work around that. I mean, if you were here in 2000, nobody talked about adaptation in this process. Now, I can say it's almost as important as, as mitigation. But this event in the Philippines, uh, and, and even early on, I, was, I started thinking about this already as the science, especially with the, the latest assessment report. It also became very clear to me that you cannot uh, ever adapt, right? There's never enough adaptation that you can do. You know, the Philippines were very proud of what we have done in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. And there's still good, good stories that come. I mean, um, one of my friends uh, is a mayor of a small uh, 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 number of islands, uh, three, three small islands or four small islands in, in the Visayas. Now, also severely affected by the storm, everything destroyed. But out of 89,000 inhabitants, only five died, okay? Because they had practiced climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction for the last 10 years, have mastered it, and they knew exactly where their vulnerabilities were, and they moved the people a day or two before. No, not, no money, no help from the national government. Everyone were told, you bring your own food. Um, and the people were ready because they have been again and again told that this was going to happen and eventually happen, right? So the mayor actually wrote me yesterday because I started posting about it in Facebook and the mayor told me and sort of thanked me about it, but said, you know, everything is still destroyed. Uh, no amount of adaptation could ever help us, uh, uh, you know, uh, now we have to all start from, from, from scratch. And, and that, that, that also, that, that this makes me realize how important it is to to, to, to mitigate as well, I mean, and, and, and to sort of see this as, as a continuum, mitigation and adaptation, adaptation and mitigation needs to be able to go together. Um, because if not, then you will, you will, you will, many of you will have the same experience that I, that I have. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, uh, one of the towns decimated, that's the term we use, decimated by the typhoon was the town of my grandmother. Six of my relatives died. Uh, all my relatives lost their homes and have nothing now. So I'm actually organizing my relatives all over the world to, to make sure we get our relatives to, to stand up uh, again, I mean, with dignity. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and, and you know, that, 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 that will happen, I mean, um, and you will have to, to bear the consequences if you don't do this. I thank all of you and, you know, especially from, from the developed countries that have been that have come out, you know, I mean, the United States is, is doing its, uh, uh, what they call the, the, the biggest humanitarian effort they've ever, they've ever had. Um, so I thank you for all, for all of that. I mean, uh, I, I think the Filipino people are very grateful for, for, for that. Uh, but we would really be more grateful if we arrive at a good agreement. I mean, uh, for this COP, you know, our, my colleague is fasting, uh, Yab Sanyo, who was my student, and now he's my teacher. Um, is, is, is fasting and we ask you to, to, to support that. I mean, tomorrow is a big day for that fasting all over the world uh, for solidarity fasting. Uh, a lot of young people are doing that. But more important, we'd like to ask you to support for this particular week for the loss and damage decision, that a good decision on loss damage is done. Uh, but ultimately, of course, what we want is over the next uh, couple of years, uh, starting with Lima next year with an elements agreement, and in Paris 2020, that we actually really have a good mitigation adaptation agreement that includes a landscape approach. So thank you and good evening. Thank you, uh, Tony. And also on behalf of the group here, we'd like to share our thoughts and prayers to the people in the Philippines and your relatives uh, in particular. We're also very grateful for your efforts in increasing the visibility of the adaptation agenda. That's extraordinarily important. Um, and also your particular reference to linking now to make the next step, linking adaptation and mitigation as the way forward. And we believe that climate smart agriculture is the way to go in that particular uh, agenda. The red negotiations which you led for a long time I think it's also a message of hope because we have seen now on the ground in the negotiations there can be progress on very difficult issues. And we hope that a similar progress can be made on agriculture. I would like now to turn to, um, to Bruce. 
to conclude um, the panel, to share uh, your views uh, of the two uh, days, and also share your views of the way forward. We're here now in Warsaw. We have the Leaders' Summit uh, next September. We have um, the next COP in uh, Peru. Bruce, maybe you want to share a few th thoughts where you see this forum going to. What is the use of this forum going forward when we build uh, the movement together? And after Bruce, uh, perhaps uh, Peter also would like to share a few words. Thank you so much. Again, Bruce, we owe you a lot with bringing this uh, forum together, together with, um, with Peter, because I think it's fair to say, although I was overstating perhaps that the world of action and the world of negotiations are very separate, it's, I think it's fair to say that also the world of agriculture and the world of fer forest are quite uh, delinked. And what the two of you have done together with your partners to bring this world together. So, um, Bruce, the floor is yours. Good. So, I mean, I just want to start off with how many superstorms do we have to have before we take it seriously? It's really late in the day. It's past uh, seven o'clock, I think. So I'm going to be very brief. But if negotiators can work till three in the morning, then surely we can work until 7.30. <laughs> uh, I've got in front of me uh, the outcome statement from the different sessions brought together by the uh, rapporteurs. It's a draft statement. It will be completed in the next few days. Uh, but I'll hand it over to the negotiators uh, just after I'm finished. I, uh, Patrick, Patrick inspires me to be active and keep you awake. So I'll walk around and challenge the photographers to see if they can keep up with me. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I've looked through these, skimmed them, and I think there's three points which I see as themes running through them. One about being more integrated, one about getting action on the ground, and one about being people-centered. So on the integrated one, uh, I think uh, Daiborn Chabonga is gonna become famous for his sayings, I think he's sitting at the back, he's a farmer from Malawi, and he says, farmers don't wake up one day to do food security, and then the next day they wake up to do adaptation, and the next way they wake up to do mitigation. And farmers are upper, often doing fisheries and forestry, and livestock keeping in their same operation. If they can be integrated, then surely Peter and I can be integrated. So I think I've, uh, as CCAFs, we've been working with 17 agricultural partners for the last four years doing Ag Day. And uh, when, the, when we started thinking about coming together, the Ag constituency was very nervous about coming together with the foresters. I heard independently that the foresters were very nervous about coming together with the with the agriculturalists, because we both thought our communities would be swallowed. I hope today has indicated that it's really feasible to work together, to do some details in forestry, to do some details in agriculture, but really to bring the two together. So on behalf of the ag constituency, I really thank the forestry constituents, Peter leading it, and the CPF bringing the two groups together. I think it was a success, and I hope we try again in the future to do something. So that was my first point. The next one was the action on the ground. And uh, uh, with respect to colleagues who work really late at night, and Patrick has indicated the complexities of those negotiations. Nonetheless, a lot of us, when I read some of the conclusions, are frustrated by the lack of progress in the governance arrangement. The architecture is not right. And therefore, the conclusions that I read in here or let's just get on and do it on the ground. Let's practice lead poli global policy. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different alliances doing things on the ground and we should really try and support them and not break them down and have complications about them. So one of them I want to mention is this emerging alliance on climate smart agriculture. Agriculture in the FAO sense of being forestry, fisheries, agriculture, the full spectrum of operations. Uh, and I want to re reiterate the words of Ambassador Sheila Sasulu, welcoming people to South Africa in the first week of December when that alliance will be discussed. I think it's gonna become a major movement on the ground. It's really about getting things happening on the ground. 
So that second point is about let's really get action going on the ground. And the, th the last point, when you read a lot of the conclusions, is about being people-centered. Uh, that we need women farmers empowered, that we need governance frameworks in place, decision support systems in landscapes, that we need the youth fully engaged. Uh, I went to the youth session, I was really inspired by it. You, often I get really depressed by being at the COPS. This was such an inspiring session. So one of the things going forward next year, do we want a separate youth session and a separate senior session? Perhaps not. <laughs> Perhaps not. Perhaps, Patrick, we should, we should really integrate the two and get the youth fully engaged. We'd like competitions for apps, for climate smart ag applications for the farmers in Kenya. We'd like all those sorts of things as part of, of, the, of the next event. So what I'll do next is I hand over the, the draft, very draft outcomes from the conference, and I hope that they're useful. I hope that the one and a half days was useful, and I hope that we, we revolutionize the next event again, and we do something slightly different, but really make progress on the ground. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bruce, uh, for your inspiring uh, um, words. It seems to me a happy marriage, uh, Bruce and Peter. Peter, uh, maybe you want to say a few words, not on behalf of the forest community, but at least from the perspective of foresters. Thank you so much. Um, I forgot how to do that. Anyway, uh, actually, Bruce, um, thanks, Bruce, for the presentation. That was really great. Bruce and I had the easy job. I remember we were sitting in a tent in Doha, and we were thinking over this possibility of having a, a landscapes forum. And we, we said, yes, okay, let's do it. But it's really, we didn't do that much more. Instead, we've had a number of excellent partners who are all represented here and a fantastic team that has made all this possible, not to speak of the government of Poland who has hosted us and, and all the rest of it. So thank you to everybody that made this possible, including, of course, everybody that organized the sessions. But to add just two small points that I picked up during the day to, to the three that uh, Bruce mentioned. One is that landscapes are really not so much about land. They are just as much about labor and capital and knowledge and the flows of these as, as we just heard from Parquero. But most of all, they are about people. You mentioned that already, Bruce. And so that's my first point. My second point is that it's really those people on the ground that are in charge. And we should really be humble when we sit here and design our detailed solutions because the solutions and the priorities that people in the landscapes will have might very well look very different and we will, ha we will have to be ready to accept that. And that, that's really a key point for the landscape approach. And therefore, I, I really want to be careful not to define it too strongly at this point. That, I think, would be too early. But anyway, I, we picked up many things during yesterday and today. I think we can leave a lot more um, informed, a lot more thoughtful, and we will come back in Peru. What do you say, Bruce? We'll see. <laughs> we'll decide that tomorrow. Thank you very much. Th thank you so much, uh, Bruce. But we do come back in Peru in whatever form or fashion because this movement is going forward. Um, we're going to conclude this uh, session right now, but we have an important afterthought. Uh, our MC will inform us what the next uh, steps are. We have a reception at play, and we'd like to invite you to join us because it would be a fruitful place also to, to dialogue each other. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, we hate to keep you too long from the reception, but a few um, housekeeping messages. Firstly, could you please return any translation material to the staff at the exit? Uh, secondly, the GLF organizers will be sending out a questionnaire 
on Wednesday, and we'd be really grateful if you could take some time to fill that out. We'd really love to learn about your experiences here to make next year's conference better. And finally, the cocktail reception will take place at the University of Warsaw Library. It's a short walk away from the campus here. There are some student uh, volunteers who will help guide us there. There is also a car um, waiting at the side of this building for people with disabilities to take them there. Um, this is a very special um, cocktail reception hosted by the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Agriculture. So please do join us there and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. <laughs>